Today's June 12, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 46. We're in the upper 40s there. Check that out. We're covering this week's stories, including Facebook's plans to transform brain science and save the world. Oh, that Facebook. Tires that know more about driving than you do. Judging strenuous movements and getting the most of an out-of-body experience with virtual reality. We're also answering more questions from Reddit this week on the subject of dark UX patterns and product pricing structures. So exciting, but I'm ready to jump into it. Today, we're all about those in-person favors, so we're going to ask you to grab a friend and turn those speakers up because Human Factors Cast starts right now. This is the longest intro ever, but let's do it! Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Oh man, and we're back! I'm pumped, you're pumped, we're all pumped, and dang, this alcohol is doing something, because it's making this a whole lot easier to talk on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> welcome back! Nick is obviously super excited this week, everybody. Man, I'm just so stoked. Okay, I'm really happy. Uh, but welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf is over there. Oh, well, hey, friends. There he is. Man, okay, so yes, this alcohol is definitely helping, I think. Like, this is only one cup, so we'll see gradually as the night goes on. But, you know, this is an entertaining show as well as a um, a news show. So I figured, what the hell, let's do it. All right, Blake, I want to ask you some things. Oh, man. So a couple weeks ago on the show, well, you know, we're always looking for those, those uh, neat little nods to the user to make things easier right so you mentioned that uh when you were binging a show on netflix you saw this skip a skip intro feature and i had mentioned to you that i was super excited about binging house of cards and uh, oh yes oh and i did i watched oh, all okay. i watched all 13 episodes in the course of like mm, probably 48 hours so did you enjoy that skip feature uh you know what it didn't show up what I know, I know. so there wasn't a on the PlayStation Four. I think it might be an artifact of the PlayStation Four. So I watch, I use the PlayStation Four as my media center, and um, you know, for whatever reason, it just didn't show up. Like it. Well, it, that's crazy. Well, I'm here to tell you, Nick. It's not just your PS4. It's only available on like the mobile and web application for Netflix. You know, Blake. Why? Why is this? What you know? It's a valuable thing. Why is this? If I was to take a guess, man, it's because those are not Netflix native products, right? These are all coming from either PS4 or, in my case, like Apple TV or Xbox. So it's up to them to kind of hook in, grab those features, and that requires an update for somebody outside of Netflix. Sure, sure, but but why why can't they just build it into their apps, right? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I was really disappointed. I was, I was super excited, excited about that feature, and then I, I was like... I found a good workaround, but <laughs> nice. What was I, the workaround? Uh, well, on on the D pad, you can press right or left and skip forward by a certain amount of seconds, and it gives you it gives you this little preview of you know what it is, and you know it's always the the White House with the upside down flag before it goes into the show. So I just stopped at that point and played it, and it was it was fine. I skipped a minute and a half of introduction every time, so I saved myself a grand total of what's thirteen times one point five is. Close to 20 minutes. There you go, man. Hey, little PS4 workaround for Netflix. That works. All right, man. So I see you have some design differences in fitness products here. What is, what yeah, is this? So I've gotten really big into uh, training with what they call like battle ropes. They're called a bunch of different things, but this is what I know it as. So just picture it as basically the rope that you would climb up in gym to touch the ceiling. But what you do is you wrap it around basically an axle or you weight it down. And you swing with both your hands, the rope, up and down or in different motions, basically just to increase your cardiovascular fitness. But I was having a really hard problem with the first one that I bought. And it was because the grip deteriorated after two uses. So whether I was holding on too tight or more likely that I just have really sweaty hands, I couldn't use it anymore. But I found from actually a company that I buy most of my fitness products from now called on it that actually introduced a grip with a specific type of vinyl taping and a rubber band that actually reduces any kind of loss of grip and this came from their own product research with users so mm. i thought it was a pretty cool little thing to 
throw out there about UX and fitness. I, I'm I'm still trying. I'm having a hard time visualizing this. So you are on like a rope. You're uh, you're on a climbing rope. Are you? Are yeah. You just climbing? Okay. So the climbing rope is what it is. But picture that you took that climbing rope off the ceiling. Right. And you like say there's a pole in the middle of the room, and you wrapped it around. So okay. You, now you're holding two handles at the opposite end. Got it. And you're basically swinging those up and down with your arms. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's about like I don't know. 12, 15 pounds in each arm, but you're swinging it over and over, which we talk a little bit about later in the show. Right, right, yeah. But, you know, that's a, it's that's a, a, just good for like quick workouts, stuff like that. That was a good tease. Um, man, so, okay, I got, I want to talk about one more thing before we jump into our stories. And, you know, we don't have, like, we've, we've kind of cut back on the stories so we can jump deeper into them. But, man, I got to cover this. Are you, have you been keeping up with any of the E3 stuff? So I really have not, man. What have you been seeing? So Electronic Entertainment Expo. This is that convention where all the all the gamers get together and uh, present their nice, pretty products to all of us. Um, and so there there are a couple announcements. Um, you know, I could I could go on and talk a whole podcast worth of. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for Battlefront Two, but I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna relate it back to Human Factor. So there's this this. I don't want to call it a problem, but this lack of interest or I guess lack of commitment towards virtual reality as a uh, sort of a gaming experience. And we'll, we'll talk about VR later about how, you know, other experiences that's see, I'm, I'm working in the teases too, man. I like we'll, it. We'll talk about VR later, but man, so they, they actually announced that, um, but in terms of like recreational, you know, uh, video gaming is is fun to experience in virtual reality because you can get lost in this world. And so, uh, speaking of being lost, well, no, that's a bad transition. But Doom and Fallout Four were announced for the VR, and uh, you know, I'm not particularly a fan of either of these series, but I know you liked. Was it Doom or Quake that you liked? Uh, I love both, and Doom would be so fun and probably super scary slash crazy in VR. So I would be stoked to try that and i actually like fallout a lot I like the series and it's more of like yeah. the kind of like wandering through the world so i i would imagine people would get really excited about that oh yeah and i'm i'm surprised you're saying that people are having a hard time committing to the vr experience so it's so it's developers it's not it has nothing to do with gotcha consumers it's developers they're having a hard time committing time and resources into these efforts and what i'm saying here is because doom and fallout are such you know, well-known franchises that consumers are going to be able to tie virtual reality to these experiences and go, yeah, I want to do that in VR. So anyway, I'm hoping that this will help that adoption rate of VR. And, you know, you know me, I have to go into my VR spiel, but um, I think, I think we should jump into the news. Now, this is the part of the show all about human factors news. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, automation design, whatever it is, as long as it has to do with the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we have up first this week? All right, so up first this week, we're talking a lot about Facebook. So Facebook's Mark Chevette spoke during a recent meeting at John Hopkins University's Applied Physics Lab about the company's new Typing by Brain initiative. Listeners nodded along as he described a brain-computer interface that would read out 100 words per minute from a speech centered in the user's brain and do so with a non-invasive technology that could rest upon a user's head. However, there's one issue that no technology exists today that can type by brain faster than eight words per minute without implanted electrodes. And we can also add to the problems that there is no real consensus on where speech lives in the brain. Chevet acknowledged these facts and agreed that Facebook's goal is ambitious, but he also stated that there's plenty of technical and research risk involved, but we're looking for the next gener- next guaranteed incremental step or we're not looking for the next guaranteed incremental step. Rather, we're looking for a transformative step. So there is a lot to unpack with this. Let's but unpack Nick, it. We've, <laughs> but Nick, we've talked about this before, so I was surprised to see it as a new thing. Um, right, well, but, I, it's in the news circuits right now because they're talking about it, right? So they're, they're And I, I think the main piece to take away from this is the fact that they are trying to transform this technology. They're not just trying to increment their way there. They are trying to come up with some mechanism that 
like revolutionizes the way that we interact with interfaces in the sense that whatever I'm thinking, I can then produce that content in front of me without having any sort of interact. It's the ultimate human computer interaction interface. Right? When you Which think I think it, is super there. necessary if we want to make any strides in this field or like the strides they want to in such a small amount of time, I think within like a two year period. Right. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, I, the the most important part to me is the transformative piece. Right. And how they're going to do that. I don't know. It's probably proprietary. They're probably not going to come out and, and, and say it. But I mean, like they say, there's there's so much risk involved. And the fact that they're going out here on a limb to do it. I mean, I, I don't know. Again, I I am very weary of this technology. I do not want something that automatically reads whatever I'm thinking. Because, man, if you heard half the babble that I was thinking while we were going through this show, it would not be a good show. <laughs> It'd get overwhelming. But So here is a little bit of a glimpse into the direction Facebook is taking. So from the article, they talk about that the team is pursuing two parallel tracks of research, right? So the first one is focusing on developing the non-invasive technology so that it'll read out this high quality neural data. So that's a big first part. And then the second is focusing strictly on the brain science. So looking for what you talked about earlier, looking for that mechanism of language and speech that they can then feed this uh, piece of technology on so they can, you know, give you the back and forth, actually do what these guys wanted to do. So I think that, that lofty goal of like the two year period, I think a lot of it's going to be much more research based and trying to define that ne- mechanism and then moving forward into the transformative technology. You know, it surprises me a little bit when you were talking there about the, the brain science, right? It surprises me because we've studied brain science for years, years, decades. And we have a good idea of where certain mechanisms lie. Wernicke's area. Rokas area. We know these things. It's 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 shocking to me that we can't. I, I mean, we have technology that can read at eight words per minute, right? But it's shocking to me that we don't know enough yet to produce something. Like I feel like the technology's there. I feel like you know we're we're on the edge of it, or, or we're very close to the precipice. Let me say that. We are very close to the precipice, and I'm actually kind of surprised we haven't we haven't gotten further with what we know. That's all I'm saying. I actually I agree with you, Nick. The thing I I do want to kind of point out, I was surprised to see the lack the part in the article that talks about there's a lack of consensus about where we are in terms of understanding speech in the brain, because I feel like there is a pretty good consensus about it, or there's at least some kind of debate, but. I, th- I think you touched on a good point of why we are where we are and what it's going to take to get to this next step in technology, what's going to be transformative. Because right. you talked about there's Broca's area. There's multiple areas of the brain, and we know that somehow the neurons aggregate across multiple parts of the brain to come together and form things like speech or thought or visual perception. And these guys really want the real, the underlying structure of how those neurons connect. Why are these the ones talking that right. are allowing us to produce speech? And I think that's the part we don't have is this, the extreme specifics to create technology to mirror what we do in our heads. Oh, I agree. I agree. I, I'm like, I'm saying, I'm just surprised that we're not as far as we we like I don't know I feel like we could be further um the parts that's interesting to me about this article so I'm looking at as I was reading this article and I'm currently looking at it to jog my memory but as I was reading this the the fact that they're trying to map sort of the semantic the semantics right and not just uh the sort of uh this is an airplane they're trying to map this is an airplane in the sky they're getting that context I think and that to me, I think, is probably where they're experiencing most of these hiccups. It's got to be, because, I mean, you're per, you're almost providing wow. an entire neural network of understanding for such small pieces. And then to, to even try to, only times when you wanted to, type out your thoughts, that's got to be an entire bag of worms that nobody's ever tackled before. Yeah. Uh, so the future's got to be interesting for Facebook. It's It's very... It's awesome to see these kind of articles coming out. 
Yeah, and I'm still scared of this technology. I will I will not I will not want this on my head. All right, let's move on. <laughs> okay. So we've talked a little bit about Facebook working on the cutting edge of technology in terms of transforming brain science, but it was also reported that the social media giant will be leveraging their platform to save the world. So yes, they announced this week they'll be using their software to lend emergency services a helping hand when natural disasters occur. When a natural disaster hits, Facebook's role in the past has naturally switched from a fun social networking platform to a tool that can be used to save lives. To further its utility during these natural disasters, Facebook has created three different types of maps to help authorities track down survivors after a disaster. Facebook confirmed that the UNICEF, the Red Cross, and the World Food Program will be the only organizations with access to this type of data, and this data will also be anonymized before release. As you'd expect, Facebook has been keen to stress that it will only share information with those who it feels can be trusted with their users' privacy. Now, I think that is a loaded statement there at the end, <laughs> talking about who can be trusted with that data. Right. But, you know, that's, that's just how it goes. People are going to get the data on you somewhere or another, but this can be used to help. It can be. And so, <clears throat> so this is... I almost said this is interesting. <laughs> I Okay, so I am looking at this, and I'm working on a project that could use technology like this. If you had crowdsourced data that informed you of areas that are safe and also uh, evacuation patterns, as well as, you know, uh, sort of... Um, where, where people are, have gone, where they have been and where they're going to during a state of emergency. This, okay, so I, I'm going to sound like conspiracy theorist here, but okay, Facebook is trying to save their customers because they want their money. That's that's the bottom line, right? They're trying to save these people. So, like, we can argue all day whether or not Facebook is feeling generous with saving people's lives but honestly the more lives you save the the more you know you're retaining the, the eyeballs exactly I mean, that's what's, what's happening exactly. here exactly exactly but that being said if you're going to use facebook you might as well get saved in the process right oh yeah for sure and i mean they're they're encouraging people to use it in a different format which is appealing because, I mean, if you abstract it to what you were just talking about, I don't know the specifics of the project, but it sounds like having localized amount of data, even from past events of potentially people who have used Facebook to understand evacuation patterns or what to do in emergency situations, it is useful. And like we're talking about, Facebook could sell that kind of data, not like personal user data, but they could sell the patterns. Man, it sounds like you know exactly what project I'm working on, but... Let's break this article down. Okay, so they have three different types of maps, right? So, yeah. So yeah. they so they have this map that kind of does a location density, right? So it's um it's kind of like a before and after any sort of disaster occurs or 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 whatever whatever that disaster is, right? So tsunami, earthquake, whatever it is, it'll show you where people were before and where people are after. Uh, and and so that's the first map, right? Do we want to break these down map by map, or do we want to just kind of do an overview and then talk about them as a whole? What do we want to do? Yeah, let's go one by one and then just talk about it as a whole, like kind of what our impressions are. Just give people a sense of what Facebook's trying to do. Sure. Okay, so this before and after map. This uh, goes into that sort of uh, information about where people scatter to when, to me, this is kind of a map where you, you get kind of a cause and effect, right? You have the disaster. You see where people are going. And to me, that is valuable for a variety of reasons. And uh, I'm curious. So what are your thoughts on this one, though, just overall? So I think this is an easy win, right? Because if the tech is already existing and you're just making a density map of people, this has a lot of utility for something like a major disaster. Um, I'm going to caveat that in a second, but think about it. You know where people were prior. You have an idea of how many people are in X place now. Well, all right, so it's 
you could probably centralize with good accuracy that, all right, this is where a big concentration of missing users are. So let's send a lot of aid there, be it, what was it, be it Red Cross or any of those any of those people. Right. But here's here's something I'm going to throw out there, and I'm going to try and, I don't know, wiggle my way around this is one. Is this the caveat? Yeah, this is the caveat for me. Let's Let's talk about something like a tsunami in a third world country where this is a a big catastrophic event. How likely are people in that region to have been using Facebook with any kind of reliability um, that you could use information like this? I mean, I'd I'd like to know a little more about what what they want to do as far as natural disasters in a wide range of areas, or if this is localized only to places that Facebook's really used a lot. Well, let me, let me tell you, man. So whether or not you use Facebook, their data collection practices are, eh, I don't want to bash Facebook because they're a business. They're just doing what they're doing. Right. But they do allow most of their permissions you basically allow them to collect data location uh, or location data, sorry, about them, even if Facebook isn't running or if it's running in the background process. So if they had clicked on Facebook to check something and then they clicked off and they were transporting themselves during a natural disaster, that data is still being fed to them. Gotcha. So and even now, a lot of phones come up with it pre-installed. So right. it's probably running in the background anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's that's how they get it. Okay, so let's let's break into the second map here. So this is a movement map. So this the first one was a before and after kind of you know where where are people um, sort of concentrated, but this one is where are people going. You can kind of see like the the flow of human bodies, so to speak. Uh, wow, that sounded really grim. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can kind of see where people are going to evacuate. You can kind of see like. Um, you know, if there's like a, a bunch of people in a certain area, you can control traffic there to, uh, you know, that's that's where you can send people to help guide others that may be straggling from the group to regroup into a certain direction that's more safe. There's a ton of applications for this one. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really adding on to the first one, right? Like, you know where they were before, where they were after, and here's watching migration patterns. But it, it's funny that you made it sound grim because this one seems grim bodies. to me an application beyond this because you're you're basically watching people's movement patterns through large areas over time and i'm assuming that data is stored somewhere and if that gets out or used that, oh, yeah. could, that could be dangerous if you ever go to google you can look at all of the location data that they have on you oh yeah it's crazy and also scary you can wipe it out but you know they hold on to it uh, okay, let's break down this third map and remind me to talk about something at the end of this article because uh, there's there's uh, I'll talk about it at the end of this article. So let's get into this third map here. This is basically so you may have seen if you're on Facebook, you may have seen this feature where uh, if you have friends in a situation that may be um, risky. So like if you have a friend in a terrorist attack or uh, a natural disaster you have the safety check tool to let your friends and family know that hey i'm safe i was in this area i'm safe i'm good to go you don't have to worry about me um because there are a lot of people who could potentially be worried about you right and so so this next map is based on that right so where it's it's kind of looking at a concentration of these areas where people consider these these safe places right so it, it's kind of identifying safe places based on where people hit that button at and you could even extend that a little farther because again it's a it is a, it is an existing t- and if like you're you've got red cross people deployed all across some area right if they're using that data to understand who's checking in and then they can then report to families or family or other organizations like okay we found like this x number of the or this person so you don't have to be looking for them anymore right um i've i've just realized a pattern between at least map one and three this is all existing tools that they had tools and technology i wonder if this was somewhere in the backgrounds of plans at all times yeah i don't know that's really interesting to think about how they kind of plan for these things um 
And, you know, a lot of times we've had something all along and then we just kind of go, oh, this would be a great application for that. And I, I have a feeling that this is uh, an extension of that. Now, let me let me talk about something before we get into the next story. So there's this guy going around. I'm not sure. OK, so I'm going to like totally I'm going to butcher this story. This isn't a, even really a story, but there's this guy going around and he's a um, what does he call it? It's like a. uh social media ethicist or something like that but he basically uh studies the philosophy and ethics surrounding what you do with data on social media or google so like what you know what are the ethical implications of providing a search result to the masses that search for this term right so think about it in like a political context you could sway elections that way or um you know what 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 are the ethics of showing somebody an ad that was paid for by somebody else right like what so he's thinking about all these and i'm i apologize cuz i don't know his name but that just kind of blew my mind and as we were talking about this story with the facebook maps i kind of you know thought back to that and said well what are the ethics of collecting these data and displaying this data and you know we say that their privacy is going to be kept intact but I mean, what what are the ethics surrounding this? And that's a conversation that I don't want to have right now. But what I do want to do right now is thank all of our friends at Engadget, The Next Web, Gizmodo, IEEE, <laughs> Scientific American, and Science Daily for bringing us the news stories this week. If you want to follow along with all the articles that we find as we find them, be sure to follow us on all our social media for links to the original articles. Blake is cracking up over there because that was such a weird transition. All right, Blake. Well, let's go ahead and dive into the next story. Thank you to the king of Segway. So we're moving into some road hazards. So some road hazards are easy for drivers to spot and avoid, like a cavernous pothole. But others aren't so easy to see. So a wet road or even one covered in ice can often be invisible to drivers who don't realize they need to slow down. But it turns out a car's rubber tires provide all the cues necessary for a vehicle to automatically know when conditions get slippery. In fact, for 20 years... Sumitomo Rubber Industries has been selling a simple deflation warning system that can automatically detect when a vehicle's tire pressure has decreased using simple sensors that measure rotational speed as well as the vibration frequencies of the tire. This stuff, Sumimoto is now introducing what it calls sensing core technology that analyzes changes in tires' vibrations. And thanks to noise-canceling technology, it can focus on the subtle vibrations of rubber on the road to determine when conditions are getting dangerous. Drivers then can be automatically alerted to slow down or drive with extra caution depending on what's detected by the tires. Now, I can't believe this is, bit, this is another instance of what we were talking about. Technology that's been used and been implemented for a long time, but finally, it's have- clicked and we're using it for something completely different. Right, and... You know, this is one of those stories that I I looked at and I was like, okay, next. And then I thought about it and I was like, wait, this has human factors implications. So to me, the most interesting part about this story here is not the technology, but the fact that we are trying to proactively warn drivers, right? We are trying to proactively provide them with some sort of support around what they are experiencing, right? So the the title of this article is your tire your car tires could soon know when roads are wet um before you can basically, right? And the fact that we are using data that's existing to try to extrapolate what types of things the driver might want to be aware about, that to me has huge implications and I looked at this article and I said where else can we get data like this? What other things, right? So I'm I'm sitting here and I'm like I'm I'm again astonished by the fact that we can find more uh sort of implications from existing data. It's all so cool to me. I love it. So all right, folks and Dick, bear with me for this one cuz it's uh I've got a crazy idea about how this okay. comes together. Because if you really think about it, this really old technology is almost a disruptor of disruptors, right? So this kind of data could even be taken from your car and not only warn you, 
but be transmitted across kind of like the hive by network of online navigation systems in different cars through your infotainment system or even go to your smartphone. So this almost bypasses things like ways where you're reporting like, hey, road conditions or cops are up ahead. Now your car is doing a lot of that work for you, taking you into the I'm just driving position and it's collecting data and sending it out, warning you, warning others. And I think that is an awesome implication of these of this system that's existed for who knows how long, at least 20 years. Well, yeah. And okay, so I'm going to piggyback off of your statement there. And we already kind of do that. If you're not aware, Google does something very similar to Facebook. If it's running in the background, it collects location data. And that's how it tells how fast traffic is for you. It aggregates the traffic going, you know, in a certain direction on a freeway. And it then relays that to you and superimposes it on its map and everything. Uh, So, yeah, I'm that's one sensor that it can use based on crowdsourced data. But, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. When we get to that level where cars are communicating with wireless networks, then they have so much more information that they can provide. If a car gets into a crash, it can automatically report it and then reroute people uh, accordingly. And with driverless technology and automation, it's only going to get better. Wow, we like went. So this article was about tires and how it can warn you about wet, slippery roads, and we went way down a rabbit hole. But I think it's important. I th- that's one of the whole reasons why I picked this story for this week because I think I, you can you can always, always, always look at technology and go, "Wow, that's cool." But the real fun is picking it apart and saying, "What can we do with this? What can we do with this cool, neat tool?" Right? I don't know. It's always it's always fun for me to try to analyze in that that sense and and kind of pick it apart i like it man i like that we deep dived on it and this was a awesome article about one of my favorite things cars okay so let's go ahead and uh switch gears and we'll talk about something else why don't why don't you go ahead and break down the next story you there blake gotcha all right so let's move away from tires perception and into our own human perceptions. So when you need a favor in this day and age, there's nothing more convenient than shooting off an email or two. It'll save you the awkwardness of an in-person pleading session. But the question is, is an email request as effective as a face-to-face encounter? Two studies show that people believe that email requests are just as effective as asking for favors face-to-face, but the results actually show something wildly different. In the first studies, participants had to reach out to strangers to take an unpaid survey, and researchers found that there was a 70% conversion rate for in-person requests, while only a 2% conversion rate for email requests. And in the second study, they found a similar phenomenon in that when participants had to ask strangers to take an unpaid survey in addition to a paid survey, that those people more responded better to the uh apologize guys they responded better to the in-person request than an email so the co- co-author of these studies and business professor at western university in o- ontario say that if people really want to have more effective email more effective email messages they're gonna have to make them more personal to facilitate building that initial trust so i had not actually thought about the implications of using email to ask for these kinds of favors or that other people would think they would rather do this instead of an in-person interaction. What do you think, Nick? So, okay, man, I have so many thoughts about this. So when I was in an undergrad, well, when I was in an undergrad, when I was an undergrad, so we actually, I was in a social psychology lab. And to me, this makes sense, right? It's one of those things that I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. We... We're going out there and we were trying to put, and I may have talked about this on the show before, but you know, whatever, I'll I'll restate it. We were going out and trying to install these in-home energy monitors that relayed information about your electricity usage inside the home. Now, when we sent out uh, a mail survey, we, I'm going to mention two books on the show. This is one of them because this is such a good book. This is Internet, Phone, Mail, and Mixed Mode Surveys, The Tailored Design Method by Dillman. Um, and we use this. So basically, the, the whole premise is that the more personalized you get, the higher the response rate. 
So if you were to write <clears throat> an email, that's not very personalized, right? Because it's probably mass mass sent out to 500 people and, you know, maybe 100 people will reply. But if you take the time to uh, instead of a email, send a snail mail, right? And so now that that t there's a little bit more process involved. You have to fold the papers, uh, include the name and address on the thing, right? Now let's take that a step further. Let's hand write the letter. Let's hand write the name and the address. Let's stamp it with an actual stamp and not like a um, you know machine that stamps it. So there are a ton of different methods that you can use to increase your response rate. Now, while I was doing this, we did exactly that. We sent out emails, didn't work. We sent out uh, snail mail, didn't work. So what we had to do was we had to go door to door and very much like Jehovah's Witness or Mormons, let me tell you about my study, right? Have you heard of this in-home energy device? It can be your Lord and savings. No, we didn't really <laughs> We didn't the really do that. must have been perfect. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, so we, like, yeah. It, anyway, we got a much higher response rate when we were in person. And so this, to me, was uh, it hit home for for starters. But second off, I thought maybe maybe this isn't something that's well known. Maybe there are people out there who did who don't know this. So when you're recruiting participants for studies, you know, ask people off the street. Don't just, you know, send out an email and hope for the best. I don't know. That's kind of my thoughts, uh, but but do you want to break down these studies? Yeah, so we can dive a little bit into the what each one entailed. So within the first study, there was like 45 participants who had to ask these 10 strangers either in person or by email to complete a survey for no pay. And people in both groups said that they expected that one in two strangers would agree and that would agree to taking the survey. Um, so they're regardless of really the quick. Mode. Let me jump yeah. in. So they're expecting a fifty percent response rate. Yes. Uh, and what's what's kind of interesting here is that there was seventy percent of people who were approached in person complied, but as little as two percent complied when they received emails. Because I would I would have thought it would have been at least a little bit higher for an email response. Because I I feel like most of my life is through Slack and email at this point, and I do have personal interactions through both those mediums. But, but with as strangers, a whole, with I guess strangers, it makes a lot of sense. Do you do you have interactions with strangers over these? Because I think that's the key factor here. You might be right. Yeah, but even so, even code call like cold reaching out to people who I don't necessarily know that have been connect that I've been connected to. Like I at least try and make my person, my emails personal enough, like expressing experience or why I'm reaching out to them, what I can do for them type of thing that right. I do get the response. But again, this is reaching out to total strangers to do something for nothing. I think that's fair. Yeah. So, I mean, because, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? You're less likely to respond to an email that's addressed. Like, from a stranger, yeah, I'm just going to trash it. But if somebody approaches you on the street and says, hey, you're you're not going to ignore them. You know, so society has taught you not to do that. Right, yeah. Let's, let's it's jump much in. easier to just ignore an email or throw it in the uh, trash bin, I guess. I agree. Let's jump into this next uh, study here. Gotcha. So in the second one, very similar to the first uh People were recruited to complete a paid survey by email or in person. But before they took that paid survey, they were offered the chance to complete a second one unpaid. Again, similar phenomenon. So canvassers un un underestimated in-person compliance and overestimated that of email responses. So emailers had an inflated idea of just how much people would actually trust them and do what they were asking them to do. Um, especially in this case, I guess, when it was unpaid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to give them some incentive to to uh, participate. Yeah, because I, I didn't even think about this. I mean, what would even make you want to open the email? Because nowadays, like, if, if you use Gmail, and I'm sure it's like this on other services, but the filters are so good and they auto-sort things into promotion, social, and just regular inbox, you might end up in a promotional... I might end up in like in a promotional box that people don't see for days. And if it's a survey with nothing exciting about it, they might not even open it. Right. If the 
like subject line doesn't say anything that's appealing. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's a whole line of research about uh, sort of incentives and whether like even something as simple as including a dollar bill in with your survey. Like, here's a dollar bill. It's a goodwill thing. Like, if you take our survey and reply to it, it's great. Um, if not, the dollar bill is yours, but people are way more inclined when you give them something first, because then they feel that, that tug of reciprocity where they have to give something back to you. Okay. I'm going to mention this one last time. If you guys want more information and this, this is not paid for by them at all. This is just a, a great book that I recommend highly. It's a freebie for them, but internet phone, mail, and mixed mode surveys, the tailored design method by Dillman. Uh, that's one of the two books that I will mention on the show today. All right, Blake, let's go ahead and jump into the next story because we got two more and then we're going to talk about Reddit stuff and I want to jump into that stuff. Gotcha. All right. So scientists are using VR headsets to create out-of-body experiences that may be able to reduce the fear of death according to a study recently published by the University of Barcelona. So according to Mel Slater, one of the study's authors, his lab has been working for many years on the influence of changing somebody's body in virtual reality and how it affects their attitudes, perceptions, behavior, and even their cognition. The study uses a VR headset and a virtual reality simulation known as the full body ownership illusion. In it, researchers created a virtual human body designed to be the participant's own. And once the participant has assimilated to the illusion, the view shifted from a first-person view to that of a third person, creating something similar to how people describe out-of-body incidences. Participants who experienced the VR simulation reported lower anxiety about death, and researchers are hoping that VR can be applied to overcome fear-related anxiety across the board. Now, I definitely not just for video games, but overcoming anxiety of steep jump. Man, I am so biased. Um, okay, so on this, and I don't like specifically put VR articles in our show to shoot them down because it has merit. But the one criticism I would have over this is how long are the effects? Yeah, what's the lasting effect of like how, I mean, how long are you not anxious? Is it right after? Is it? weeks months seconds i don't know that's a good point right so i mean yeah it all comes down to can we alter the behavior can we change your thoughts feelings emotions regarding this experience right and i think that if you were to expose people over time it would act similarly to any other treatment of a phobia if you were to expose people to spiders in a virtual environment, you'd eventually curb their arachnophobia. And I feel that by exposing people to situations where they are dying peacefully or it, it's an out of body experience. It doesn't actually show them dying, which is why I'm confused about the results of this. Yeah, that I mean, that's another good point, Nick. It's only showing them what it's like to basically have an out of body experience. Um, and I don't know how that correlates with their feelings about death. Um, I can I could abstract this a little bit away from just the anxiety of death. Right. And say that maybe in instances where. I don't know, there's high cost of entry to actually having somebody really be in a situation, maybe for PTSD. I know that it's, it's oh, yeah. used a little bit for PTSD. Absolutely. Uh, lowering anxiety. And I mean, it it definitely cuts cost barrier to some degree and maybe pro- provides a, I don't know, another intervention in the toolkit of trying to get people over anxiety. But I'm, I'm as confused as you are, I think, about how this really relates to death and what the lasting effects are. Yeah, I mean, look, there's definitely some merit to it. I just question their methods a little bit. And, you know, aside from that, though, like, it it just does go to show that you can use virtual environments and virtual reality to sort of alter the way that people perceive things. And it's another one of those instances where I'm like, okay, this is an interesting application that maybe we can use in other situations. I don't really have a whole lot more to say other than this has merit. (laughs) I mean, 
let's let's actually show somebody dying in a virtual environment. Like let's get gamers in there who are used to seeing avatars die. And what what are the psychological effects of seeing that? Right? Like what are, what are the psychological effects of seeing your avatar that's shaped like you die? Well, see, now you've brought even a more interesting point into this is how effective is this going to be on people that play video games or those that get into VR right. where they potentially are seeing avatars of themselves potentially in third person if you play something like Gears or any kind of RPG where you are watching your avatar die all the time. I mean, yeah. you you get disconnected and very desensitized to it. Right. Uh, the, the, only, the last kind of point that I have about this is... It was it was a small study. I mean, it's thirty two people, um, and six it was sixteen of which are control. So I mean, right. it's it's pretty small, uh, and I'm sure it'll only escalate. Um, I but see that's more. just a, a part I like to point out. I mean, that might be why they're seeing such a great difference is because it's such a small change. Yeah, I, I want to see more. I think this is a good inkling in the right direction, but I want to see more because I mean, personally, all the avatars that I create are for the most part, resemble myself. You know, that they're a little bit taller and more muscular and uh, more athletic, but they all resemble me fairly, you know, accurately. And uh, and so when I see them die, it, you, you brought up a good point with that disconnection. I am disconnected from it, but it looks like me. And I, you know, in some certain, in some circumstances, I feel like I am playing that character. Right. So like in a story heavy game, you know, I, I feel invested in the character that looks like me. And so it's interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. The I would like to there there is a million spawn off studies that I would like to run on this, but uh, I don't have the bandwidth to do it. All right. Let's move on to our next story. All right. Let's finish it off. It's our last one, right? Yes, it is. All right, so scientists from the German Primate Center have determined which characteristics of an arm movement influence the subjective effort associated with this movement. So their study found that duration, biomechanics, and force had an influence on the effort, while movement amplitudes had no effect. More importantly, the results shed light on a long speculated link between two important brain functions, that of optimizing action selection and decision making, and in movement execution. When choosing between alternative actions, we have to compare the positive outcomes of those actions and then weigh them against their costs. So understanding how we estimate movement effort may provide us with more information about how we make decisions and the underlying mechanisms for decision making. Now, this feels like a giant throwback to when we did the biomechanics episode a long time ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To me. Okay. I always say this makes sense, but maybe it doesn't. So I'm I'm looking at this and I'm I'm analyzing this from the perspective of like let's let's put it in a in a perspective of something like desire paths, right? That may or may not cause uh more um movement, right? So you may I, I'm talking like macro scale. This is talking micro scale. This is like movements. I move my hand to my cup. Uh do I move it straight? Do I move it kind of at a curve to come to it? I'm talking macro movements. How do we perceive those big change, like those big choices that would result in either a lot of effort? Do you climb up the hill or do you go up the ramp? Right? The ramp obviously will take longer, and but it's, it's a flatter surface. Or do you climb up the hill, which will take a little bit more effort right now, but you'll get there quicker. So... These the, the interesting piece to me is that cost and outcome sort of piece. And I, I'm curious to see where it goes. Yeah, this is, again, a very preliminary like finding, I think. And But I do see that it makes a lot of sense. I mean, so we can talk a little bit about the study because I know we didn't cover it in the beginning. So... What the researchers did is they had people repeatedly choose between different arm movements that differed in the amplitude so and duration as well as the force. What they again saw was that effort increased with the strength of a force-resisting movement, but the more important thing here was that researchers showed that the distance covered by the movements did not determine the actual effort. So effort was more so dependent on the duration of those movements. Uh, So this... 
this again for me goes back to exercise and as we learn over time we can refine how we how we exercise to get the most out of it right and this kind of lends it to a similar to a similar feel um so take like what i was talking about earlier doing a battle rope exercise that takes all of 20 minutes because of the amount of effort that you have to put into it and what it does to you metabolically over time throughout the day. Whereas if you did a much harder but longer workout, you might get the same effect, but you're not gonna get, it's not going to be as strenuous and you might not get the same benefits out of it. So I, th- I just think there's, again, this is very preliminary, but I do like the analogy between, okay, if we understand better about how we make movements and we make those choices, maybe we can make that analogous to making better decisions in general. Right. And, you know, I, so yes, these studies are very preliminary, but the purpose of this podcast even is to just get a kind of a cursory glance of what's going on in the field, maybe get those brain juices flowing. Maybe someone, one of our listeners who's listening to this right now comes up with this amazing idea and comes up with, you know, the next big thing that we talk about on the show. It's a vicious cycle. Very true, man. <laughs> Very true. All right. Uh, is there anything you want to close out on this? Because I want to get to Reddit. Dude, let's get to the Reddit. That was my favorite thing last episode. So let's oh, see man. what's up. You know what? Before we continue, listeners, I want to know. We want to know. Do you like this section? Do you not like it? Like, let us know because we're we're doing this for you. But let's get into this. This is, uh, this is the it came from Reddit section. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. So this is any any subreddit out there, as long as it relates to human factors and kind of encourages discussion among the community, uh, be it human factors, user experience, whatever it is. Right, today's entry was found on the user experience subreddit from Sundried Tomatoes. And that's, a, <laughs> that's an awesome username. Sundried Tomatoes writes, is it now okay to request people to sign up for your service without disclosing pricing structure? So they go on to say, I will keep I keep running into this on various websites where it's hard or impossible to figure out what a service will cost. You're required to log in first or go through many hoops without having an idea, any idea, sorry, without what their service uh, fees will ultimately be. Usually there's a free trial and you aren't on the hook until after you enter your info. But personally, I like to know how much something costs before signing up and I shy away if I can't find out. I'm wondering if this is a best practice to get people to convert, get them in the door before telling them the price. Here's a few examples. And then he goes to uh, detail tailwindapp.com and squarespace.com. And then uh, he also mentions that it's there. If you scroll to the bottom and look at the footer, it's totally buried. I seem to come across this more and more and more, or sorry, more and more lately. Is this a good design or user experience? Or is it just a practical, just practical since more people will actually convert and sign up? Thanks for sticking with me through that one. That was a mouthful, but this is this is an important question, Blake. So I want to I want to ping you first because I have some very strong opinions about this. I want to know what you think of this one. So I am very I'm very two faced on this topic, and I definitely get the frustrations. I understand that. It definitely has driven me mad before that I want to use a product, you say, have a free trial, but the only way I can use it is by giving my credit card information, and that's a lot of, lot to be, for me to want to give you. And I mean, I don't know. If I'm like anybody else, perhaps I'll forget, and they'll be able to charge me year after year or month to month. But nonetheless, if you look at it from a business perspective, I start to understand a little more what's going on here. Um, and so my big takeaway from this and when i thought about it it was like we when you start a business if it's a small one big one you want to make money and sometimes people do that in a sneaky way but are they really that wrong here so what if you put a product like let's say it's an app for some service that just the app market is horrible what if you put out a product that's premium and very good and just covers all your users needs but In order to keep it going, you need to have people convert and pay your premium price. So you hide it from them up front, how much it's going to cost, but they use your application, see its utility, and then and only then do they convert to taking and using your app. When it comes to something like that, it makes it a little easier to see how maybe a startup 
or larger companies use a tactic or a strategy more than just trying to make you mad. Let me jump in here. So I want to I want to comment on something that you're talking about here. So you're talking about a, basically a try before you buy, but I think what the ethical sort of decision surrounding this is it might be more along the lines of okay if i don't like that product now you have my information you have my information and you're going to keep bothering me about your product until i buy it you're going to wear me down until i either buy it or blacklist you so there's a whole i mean and and you get so much data off of what they have you sign up with. Sometimes they want your name. Sometimes they want your phone number even so they can call you and harass you because they don't want to show you the price. So I agree with what you're saying, Blake. I agree. And and uh, do you have any other finishing thoughts on that one before I jump into my thing here? No, I want to hear your take on it because... I'm interested to see where you go with yours. All right, so this is... Okay, so I mentioned there are two books this time around that I'm going to mention that I'm going to recommend. This one, the second one here, is Evil by Design by Chris Nodder. So this one kind of takes a look at the seven deadly sins. And I mentioned this before on the show a long time ago, but he takes a look at the seven deadly sins and how design manipulates our... our, uh, sort of desire to sin for a lack of a better explanation. It looks at our desire to sin and kind of explains away design in terms of that. So let me bring out a few sort of examples from his book here. So he he says you want to make options hard to find or understand, right? So if you do this, there in these examples here, they're hiding the options by hiding the price, it makes it more likely that you'll sign up, right? So that's the conversion piece. That makes sense. Um, We all know what's going on there. But, I mean, the average Joe may not know that that's what they're trying to do. They just want your data. So another thing is closure, right? They appeal to your sense of wanting to complete your task of investigating for a price. And that task is not complete until you understand the pricing structure of whatever it is you're trying to get. Right. So you have you're you're trying to get this sense of closure and you won't get it until they get your data. And it's frustrating. So they're playing on that 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 need for closure. Now, they're also playing on this foot in the door principle where you're making a commitment to a small thing of giving them their data before they convince you about a big thing like signing up for this really expensive service or committing to a price. Right. So there's there's you know, there's virtually no harm except for giving them your data and potentially getting harassed via email or phone uh, versus, you know, committing to that price, right? So that is the trade-off. So there are a couple ways that you can go about this. I hate this personally, um, but like you said, Blake, at the end of the day, it is a business and, uh, but let's, hang on. Before we, before we end this segment, I do want to address this. So Sun-Dried Tomatoes actually says, uh, is this good design or user experience or is it just practical since more people will actually convert and sign up? And I think we're both on the same page here, but I think it's just so people convert and sign up and it's evil by design. Yeah, I have to agree. It's totally an evil by design deal. Try and just get, get your money and run away with it. Just doing it in a tricky fashion. Yeah, those tricky, tricky UX designers designing for evil not doing good there needs to be some (laughs) justice we need we need a ux batman to save us from all this bad design all right let's the ux dark side man oh my god let's close this thing out that's it for today everyone if you like the it came from reddit section let us know uh if you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that we you think we missed you can head on over to our social media you can head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn page, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join our discussion on the SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, uh, leave us a voicemail at 901 646 1432. That's 901 646 1 HFC. And no, we will not call you back and harass you to sign up for our HFC premium because we don't even have that. We bring these things to you ad free. And if you like that we bring these things to you ad free, you can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash human factors cast. Blake loved that transition. 
<laughs> Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We are all over the place. And, of course, you can reach us on our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnstorf, I want to thank you so much for helping me break down these news stories this week. Where can our listeners go and find you? Well, thank you for having me, as always. And, friends, you can find me at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. That's with two O's. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. Oh, it depends. It depends. Pricing structures. It's not musical attention. Pricing structures. 